Today, um, kids, parents, um, grandparents, and extended family, uh, welcome to Chronically PWS. Uh, my name is TJ, and um, I just wanted to come on here and, and talk about my history with gait issues, erythro, erythromytosis, and um, and I'll explain what that is. Um, it's an let me do that now. It's an excess production of red blood cells. And um, I'll let you know how that affects me in just a moment, or it uh, did affect me in just a moment. Um, let's start with gait issues um, that I had. Uh, being so lucky, I can't really relate to um, the issues that individuals have with the debilitating um, scoliosis and hip displacement issues uh, that I have. Although I think I might have some hip issues later on in life, I, I can't really relate to it now because I've never had um, that occur um, for me at this point. I did have some considerable gait issues reaching about age eight or nine. And I, I, I think this might have been due to obesity, um, but also probably just the, the um, occupational issues that I had for so many years. Um, uh, with walking and, and, and things like that. The gait issue that I had is that I would pronate the step. The actual front of my foot would hit the ground first when I walked. And um, I had a little bit, I have an issue on my right side. My right side is kind of shorter. The leg is shorter. It's just a little, little, little bit more developed on the right side than it is the left. So um, I would pronate in the front, kind of limp. A little bit on the right leg and I still do that sometimes because of the shortness in that leg it's about half an inch shorter than the left leg I can't really recall it's been a while since I've been to a muscular skeletal doctor um, regarding it the fix for that for the pronation part of it was around that time I had an, a uh, lift built for the center of my shoe that would basically um, encourage me to walk more hill first. Naturally, when you step, you want the force to be evenly distributed across the foot. My problem was that I was pronating, so I was putting it on the, the ball of the foot. Um, and the shoe basically had a ridge, like a, a rubber polycarbonate rubber helped that would make the foot rock. If you put the shoe on, it, it could rock from toe to heel. But what it was, the idea was it would encourage me to walk on my heel more so eventually I could walk more distributed with my weight more distributed across the foot instead of on the ball of the foot or on the heel. So although the, the correction was getting me to walk on the heel, but over, the overall idea is it would just correct pronation to where I would walk flat footed. I did that for a couple of years and that really did help. And, um, it, you know, it was, it was always crazy because I'd be, um, the the shoes that we had made for me were um like dress shoes you know my foot was so wide from uh being so obese at the time that i had to wear like a man's a man size 10 and so the shoe was big on my foot plus the fact that it had the orthopedic um accommodation or bridge thing and then the fact it was a dress shoe so for a couple of years in grade school that's what i wore um, none of the kids really busted my chops about it, and I didn't really face hazing on that specifically, but it was, it was a curiosity, I'm sure. That's what I did for the gait issue. You know, I still kind of have it, and I still have, like, I still have issues with lifting and the way my weight's distributed on that side of my body, that it's really easy for me to kind of tweak that side or have a rib out. You know, if I do a lift too hard where, you know, the rib will be slightly misaligned. I don't know what the technical name is for that one. After all that, you know, I get out of these shoes and I think I wore that through Scouts. I think Scouts was a good, it was a good look for the Scouts because then you had your khakis on and your little bandana on. And then, you know, you had these goofy looking or, you know, these adult looking shoes. So it all worked out then. So I think that was on those Scout days, I probably looked pretty cool. Uh, erythromytosis, production of red, excess production of red blood cells um, in the bloodstream caused by JAK2, which I didn't really look into it deep, 
too far. I had to do a little bit of research because I'm like, what was that called? I know what it, what the end result of it was that I was producing too many red blood cells. And the fact um, of it was the, in an infant, you produce red blood cells from your elbows and your kneecaps. It, it kind of starts all over initially. And then as you're, as you grow production centers in your bone marrow, they kind of become more centralized into the center of the body. So eventually it's, I think it's just like from your thoracic cavity, your abdomen, that you produce those red blood cells. Um, but everywhere else, as you grow, it would normally taper off and the bone marrow would produce, you know, it wouldn't produce, you wouldn't produce red blood cells um, throughout the body. So when I was 13, 12, 13 years old, I played football um, uh, in eighth grade and, um, it was crazy. Um, you know, I, w I didn't do a whole lot. I did, you know, it was, it was pretty tough, um, for me just being obese, but I did lose a good amount of weight and it was a healthy thing. Um, I got an injury that was kind of weird. I was out doing, you know, part of the football is up downs, you know, where you're, you jump up, you know, in the air and then you land on your stomach and or land on your you know just land on your stomach with your arms you know you kind of break your fall a little bit but it's kind of there to teach you that if you get it you know it's it's an exercise obviously it's it's it can be strenuous but it um also teaches you a little bit about how to recover if you're tackled or hit or sacked you know so um we do that you know and we do 10 to 20 um up downs um sets of two or three, I can't remember, it's been years, but, um, uh, so we do that, and then I would notice that any kind of impact or collision that my knees would have on the ground, it felt like they would just become weird, like they were inflamed, but it didn't seem like I would take aspirin or anything like that, and it would go away, and it just felt like it felt like my kneecap was floating a little bit. Just, it didn't feel right. So, uh, my mom took me to the doctor and they're like, well, this could be something really different. What we're going to do is, uh, we're going to, I'm referring to a muscular skeletal doctor and we'll see what's going on. And they did an MRI magnetic, my magnetic resonance test, um, on pretty much my whole body, um, uh, you know, arms, shoulders, and everything to see. Well, they started with the legs, but then they're like, well, we want to look more. We want to look at other joints because we need to compare. And um, that's when they came out with this idea that I had erythromytosis, meaning that um, I was still producing red blood cells from my elbows and from my knees. And that was a little bit delayed in red blood cell production. Um, that I had an excess of red blood cells and it was a little bit delayed and weird about how I was producing them. They say it wasn't as cl clinically significant, but because of the activities that I was doing at the time, it would become, you know, uh, it could become problematic. I don't know what the end result would be if I like, you know, this would easily dislocate my kneecap or whatever, but they're like, just don't really, you know, when it comes to that exercise, don't do it. Okay, easy enough. So, got to know, no more up-downs, yada, yada, yada. I still played football. That's fine. Played the entire year. But it was just weird that, you know, all these little milestones of things that you hit, you know, you would think as an infant that that would be something that would, your red blood cells would be produced different place, you know, in the places that were they're supposed to, you know, that it, it, it follows you through. I, you know, bringing up that story, I just want to also comment about um, how you, with Prater Willie, respond to things differently uh, with medications and so forth. Obviously, I'm sure that everybody that's watching this that has a child that has Prater Willie knows that you respond, we respond to uh, pain medicines because we generally have high tolerances for pain. Um, but when we're in pain, it, it can be difficult to control because you don't know. And then there's all these other, um, factors that you have, you know, you really have to have a good pain management system, um, to kind of work through. Um, 
but pain medicine's one thing. What about other medicines um, we've reacted to? Obviously, I've let you guys know, hey, I'm allergic to a lot of different classifications of antibiotics. Um, and I do think that we have, uh, Prater Willie might indicate a different immune immuno response to um, antibiotics and things like that and, and to medicines that you take. I think that we're more likely to at least show sensitivities to things that other people might tolerate really well. Um, and I find that for my myself. And it, it just becomes that a lot of medicines, oral antibiotics that I take that I'm still technically um, overly sensitive to and can react and get rashes and things that I just kind of do that with Benadryl. That's kind of like the, that's kind of like the, the protocol for me because I would rather be able to take the oral antibiotic and still have some effectiveness of, off it. That way if the infection gets too bad, I still have those IV antibiotics that I can work through. And, you know, it really does, it isn't fun because, you know, I'm taking Benadryl, so where's dad? Good night, dad. You know, <laughs> when I take, uh, when I take those oral antibiotics, but I think that might be something, you know, related specific to me that I'm kind of overly sensitive, uh, to things like that. Um, one thing that I wanted to bring up that it, I had a rare side effect to a specific antibiotic that you don't hear much about, but it's a, uh, it's, you don't hear much about it. It's a rare side effect, but it can be, for rare side effects, it's common. So I think it's like uh, 118 out of, you know, one out of 118 people may have this, you know, a level of this agitation with this um, antibiotic. But um, what it is, is if you take Leviquin, um, if you have this, you can have this specific reaction to Leviquin, which is in the ciprofloxacin, Floxacin um, family of antibiotics, where you'll actually get some um, tendonitis in different places of your body, namely, you know, your heels because you use those joints the most, but it it will cause tendonitis. Well, that you know, I hit that lottery on that one, so I would take Leviquin, and it about four weeks after I got through a 21-day course, which was a prolonged course of Leviquin, when Leviquin. Um, I got Achilles tendonitis in both my ankles and it really, it went away in the right foot, but the left foot just didn't, it didn't work out right. It wasn't going away for some reason. So the some reason was that I had a, um, a bone spur and a ganglion cyst on, or yeah, in that foot and it wasn't going to go away. It's just the Leviquin had ad, ad, agitated it enough to where it was more clinically significant for me um, that I had to have it treated. So that led me down the path of having ankle surgery, which, you know, was a challenge. And I think the outcome of that... Um, <laughs> You know, I had the ankle surgery, I had the knee block and all that, and I went through all that, but um, uh, I was on one of those scooters uh, for it, and, um, you know, they, I had just gotten off the bandage. I was still in um, sutures, and, um, but they're like, you got to be really careful with this. You want to keep it bandaged and wrapped and make sure you don't traumatize it. About the first day <laughs> I put my foot down and that was it. It popped every single suture on my foot and, um, had to go have emergency suturing. Went to the emergency room, the emergency rooms said, you know, your, um, your surgeon would take care of this. We're not touching it, you know liability, whatever. I'm like, well, great. Well, can you do something for me? No, you're just going to have to follow up with them next day. You know, we could have taped this, had it happened, had we known about it the day before, we might have been able to use suture tape and, and help you out, but now we're going to have to full on suture it. And because of where it's at, we really can't give you, you, we can give you the lidocaine to suture this, but it's really not going to take because you don't have much circulation 
through that part of your foot. 25 minutes of excruciating pain later, I had re my foot was resutured. They recast it and it slowed down my healing uh, another three months on that foot. Needless to say, after all that was done, it took physical therapy because I I was off my foot longer than I needed to be because of the suture thing um, or that, that I should have been or they had planned for. So I had, you know, a lot of atrophy and things going on that with that foot and I just really couldn't walk on it at all. Couldn't put any weight. Once the sutures were out, it was just so weak and painful. I couldn't do anything. So I had to go to be referred to physical therapy and then I did aqua therapy. So it was a process. Was it worth it? I'm up in the air, I'm good now, you know, but I mean, it occasionally hurts. I still have like um, problems with it, but uh, still not fun. Needless to say, I just want to say that this really good firm assumption that your kids are going to respond differently to medications already, but I just want to say that that follows you through life. The more that you can be aware of that in the health plan and the more that you make the primary care doctor aware, especially because you're going to go through these transitions and primary care doctors through your life. You know, I went and I had, you know, my pedi my pediatric doctor actually, my pediatrician followed me until I was 21, uh, given the situation that I was uh, in. So he was good enough to do that. And then he referred me to somebody that he trained um, that was a family medicine doctor. So that was great. And I had him for a, a decade. And then um, I was referred, or not referred, then I kind of had to shop myself for primary care doctors. But the whole time you kind of rank, rack up these different responses, different, you know, different things that happen with medicines and with pain medicines and with antibiotics and all the challenges. So I guess, you know, bringing up your erythromatosis was part of this, but maybe just, you know, stressing on the fact that these weird responses to medications are going to happen um, for your entire life. People that don't have proto willy have weird responses to reactions to medicines too, but I think it's kind of acute here um, as an adult with proto willy to have these kind of weird responses. Something to think about in the long term for your child, where if you're an adult, you know, something to think about too, that you always might be in that, uh, that uh, mode of self-discovery. Sit here and have this little chat about uh, my history. And um, if you wanna comment, um, talk about, you know, weird responses that your children have had to medicines or you yourself have. Again, if you have Prader, uh, prader willi syndrome and you're seeing this video as an adult, please reach out to me. Um, you can email me, um, my nickname is TJ, but you can email me at trulyjared, um, at gmail.com, at, um, you can email me at themeparkbebop at gmail.com, um, just feel free to, you know, or you can just respond directly in this, in this video. Um, you can find me on in Instagram at chroniclypws on Instagram, reach out, and, um, I would, I would love to talk to you. Um, I would love to exchange phone numbers and just sit down and talk because um, if you're an adult with these situations and, um, you know, you're, um, you're kind of in my scenario, I'd love to meet someone um, with my scenario of, of prodder willy And um, again, if you're a parent of a child with prodder willy and you're facing these weird things with them too, um, please comment below, talk about it. Um, Again, you can go back to Instagram and, and post to Instagram as well. Uh, I'll engage you there. But um, again, it was just a pleasure to have this opportunity to talk to you. And, and um, I'll talk to you again soon. Bye.